So, um, good afternoon. Um, welcome to this Museum Heritage Highland event delivered as part of the Highland Threads Exhibition Events Programme. Um, this event, event is being hosted by the West Highland Museum in Fort William and I'm its curator, Vanessa Martin. Um, just to introduce you a bit to the museum, um, we're an independent museum and a charity that is based in the heart of the Highlands of Scotland. Our collections focus on Highland life, uh, the Jacobites, local history, the natural world and Victoriana. Um, this year we're about to celebrate uh, 10 years offering free entry to visitors. Um, during this period, um, visitor numbers have risen from 9,000 in 2011 up to over 60,000 visitors in 2019 before the pandemic hit. Um, because we're free, we rely on donations to um, cover our operational costs. So today's event is free, but if you're able to support our work, please do visit the Museum Heritage Highlands Highland Threads exhibition webpage and visit our site and you can support us directly on there, or you can visit our website to donate. Thank you. So um, today we'll be focusing on our fabulous beetle wing dress, which is in our Victoriana collection. Uh, this dress um, once belonged to Barbara Morrison, a Highland lass um, with a fascinating story to tell, which we'll hear more about today. Um, so here with me to join in our discussion, exploring the history of the outstanding example of this 19th century Indian textiles, um, we have Joe Fitzhenry, um, who is creator of the Fitzhenry database and a family genealogist. Uh, we have Kath Jones, um, she is Barbara Morrison's great great granddaughter and also the great great granddaughter of William Fitzhenry, Barbara Morrison's um, husband, who we'll hear more about later. Um, and she is also the daughter of the donor um, of the dress to the museum, um, Mrs. Tanya Stewart Davis. We also have uh, Kenna Libes. Um, she's a postgraduate student at New York's Fashion Institute of Technology, um, and she will, is a leading authority on beetle wing dresses. And we're also pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Jim McPherson. Um, he's senior lecturer at the University of the Highlands and Islands and Centre for History and module leader of the MLIT British Studies. And also we'd like to welcome Blair Sutherland, who's researcher at the Royal Jackets, sorry, the Royal Green Jackets Rifles Museum in Winchester. And finally to Joe Watson, um, who's coordinated this project on behalf of the museum for us, which we're very grateful for. Um, she is a dress and textile historian of the Scottish Highlands and Islands and postgraduate student at the University of the Highlands and Islands. Um, so um, we'd like to start by explaining a bit about how the dress arrived at the West Highland Museum. Um, we've got very limited records for the period, um, but it shows that the dress arrived, it was a full length muslin dress decorated with beetle wing dress, with beetle wing decorations, and it arrived along with a shawl at the museum in 1993. Um, it had been gifted to us by uh, Mrs. Tanya Stewart Davis of West Yorkshire in England. Um, at the time it came to the museum, the museum was being refurbished. So the dress didn't immediately go on display. Um, it was sort of just held in storage for a wee while until the um, museum reopened again in around 1996. So we knew very little about the dress at the time, um, apart from what Tanya told us. So we knew that it was had belonged to Barbara Morrison, who was a crofter's daughter with links to Inverness and to Skye. Um, so in 1998, um, the previous curator, Fiona Mar Marwick, um, she contacted the V&A in London and was given more information about the dress. So we, we found out more about how it was constructed and also the type of beetles that had been used for the decoration. But that was as far as our research went at that point. Um, so the dress went on permanent display, as I say, in 1996, at where it has been ever since in our Victorian collection. However, as part of the Highland Threads exhibition, um, which is the digital exhibition, we are going to focus on the dress some more in the gallery. Um, so the story of the dress is gonna to be told in a temporary exhibition that Joe's going to be putting together for us um, in our temporary exhibition space, which will be available from June till November. The museum reopens on the 1st of June. And if you do plan to visit, do remember that COVID restrictions are still in place and that you do need to book with us ahead of your visit. Um, so um, we're really excited when in 
2020, um, Jo approached me and suggested that she'd like to focus on the dress for her dissertation. Um, this gave us the opportunity to learn much more about the dress and its history. Um, as a result of Jo's hard work and extensive research over lockdown, um, we've learned so much more about the dress um, and the experiences of the lady who wore it, that's Barbara Morrison. So you'll hear more about her story throughout the afternoon. Um, one of the puzzles um, with the dress was how it came to be gifted as, to us in the first place um, when there was no obvious links to Fort William. Um, this mystery was resolved a bit once we were introduced to Kath Jones. Um, so we, we couldn't establish any link between Barbara or the donor, Tanya, with, with Fort William. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce Kath to you, um, who, as we say, is Barbara's great, great granddaughter and also the daughter of Tanya, who donated the dress to us. So over to you. <laughs> uh, my name's Kath Jones and it was my mum that donated the dress. This has all come as a massive shock to me and unfortunately it's really, really sad because two years ago mum actually died and mum would have been amazed at all of this. Um, mum was part of the Stuart Society, so I spent an awful lot of time in Fort William and this is the one of the main reasons I think she donated the dress. The other thing that I find so interesting is that when mum died, because this was a lifelong passion for my mum of family history, mainly because she didn't know an awful lot about her family on her father's side. But what I found more interesting is that when Jo has come to me with different names, which I've then been able to put and piece together in the family Bible that was left to me by, they had the names in the Bible are actually Barbara's children, who would have made my grands, aunties and uncles with all the dates in, but my mum actually found all of this out already before the internet even existed. So I'm not entirely how she did that, but there's a letter upstairs where she contacted to try and get birth records of Barbara back in the 50s, uh, which I just find absolutely amazing. Um, so this has all come as a massive shock to me because I didn't actually know I knew about the dress, but I thought it was at Barnard Castle. So obviously I was very wrong there. Um, Mum would have been amazed to know what everybody has done um, and how much effort they've put in. And I just find it absolutely amazing. And I'm just so, so grateful to the museum and I can't wait to come and see it. We look forward to your visit, Kath, we really will. <laughs> Okay, um, so Jo, I think you were going to chat next, weren't you? Thank you very much, Vanessa, for the introduction. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the information that you gave me to start with and how the project just keeps on, you know, every time I email Jim about it, I'm just like, well, you never guess what's happened, you never guess what's happened, and how it's just keep, keeps on mushrooming. Um, and I, I really do believe that this story needs to be told. Um, I'm very passionate about finding out about the lives of Highland women weren't really written about and even if you just look at the dress it's very much uh, focused on men and Highland dress we associate with men but yet women wore clothes as well so that's something that I feel quite passionate about is about telling women's story as well so with the work that I'm doing now and the work that I'm going to be going on to do um, hopefully with the museum looking at women's textiles um, it's, it's about um, telling those stories um, and making sure they're not forgotten for future generations. So the information I got from you, um, you told me some basic information from what you could tell me um, from the donor information, that the dress had belonged to a Barbara Morrison, um, who was born in Inverness in about 1828. I now know that isn't true. Um, that um, she was married to... Um, an army officer, British army officer that she had met in Jersey. I know that's true. Um, they went to India aboard the Himalaya. Again, that is true. Um, and that the dress was made for a social function. Haven't found out which social function yet. There's plenty to choose from. So lockdown happens, pandemic strikes, and the life of a historian is completely turned upside down. Uh, because we can't go to our favourite places in the world, namely archives. 
Um, so what do we do? Um, we look online and we use online resources. So I've actually been a, an amateur genealogist myself for about 20 years. Um, and I've done my family tree, I've done my husband's family tree, and I, I really, really enjoy it. And, you know, it's wonderful when you find a newspaper article in the British newspaper archive from 1815 quoting something one of your ancestors said. Um, it, you know, it actually makes you feel quite full of pride and you well up and start crying and things. Um, so I used the, the methods that I was familiar with as an amateur to see what I could find out about Barbara Morrison. Um, because for me, um, something Kenna said in our, um, I've been thinking about this so much, Kenna, something Kenna said in our podcast um, that we did a few weeks back about how museums are colonial entities and this dress is a colonial entity, you know, it's, it's a symbol of colonialism. It's really struck a chord with me. Um, and thinking about how museums are now it's not necessarily telling a colonialist story um but perhaps it's we're actually more interested in the people and i think uh, historians today have a duty to explain the stories um, that are contained within the four walls of a museum um i use the tools that were familiar to me so i've used ancestry i've used find my past i've used scotland's people and the wonderful wonderful british newspaper archive I've been able to track where William Henry was based, which I now know, thanks to Blair, is, is accurate, where William Henry was based, because it was published in the newspapers. I know that when they went on the ships, because it's, it was published in the newspaper that Captain Fitzhenry, the quartermaster of the 3rd Battalion of the 60th Rifles, was going to India with his wife and child. Um, and they came back with two children, which is another mystery. Um <laughs> lots of things like that it's just amazing what you can find out and then also the wonderful archive.org um which has so many wonderful victorian publications um and all of this is available not for free well most of it's available for free but it's a tool that we can use online nowadays to do the research and it's been absolutely amazing um after doing the family tree, I, I remember this call to Vanessa one day saying, Vanessa, I think I found the name of the donor. And I didn't realise at the time that the actual donor's name is on the plate in the museum. Uh, so I'd spent, I don't know, what, about two weeks uh, starting this family tree. And lo and behold, I found the name of Tanya Stewart. And from there, it took a while, but actually I came across, how long have I been in touch with you now, Kath? About three months? Yeah. I actually found Kath's mum's obituary in the newspaper. So I got Kath's name from that and just Google Kath, basically. And it came up with a Facebook profile. You know, obviously speaking to Kenna and learning from Kenna about her research. And Blair has been an absolutely wonderful source of knowledge. Um, there's nothing that gentleman doesn't know about the, 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 the 60th rifles. Um, and just bouncing ideas off with Joe Fitz. But yeah, I've got that book as well. Um, <laughs> Joe Fitzhenry's been absolutely amazing. I found Joe's website completely by accident. Thanks for inviting me. So I'm Jo Fitzhenry and um, I'm a keen amateur genealogist and I've been doing sort of like Fitzhenry stuff uh, for just about over 20 years now. It started off because I'd never met a Fitzhenry that I wasn't related to. And so I thought that if I collected all of the Fitzhenrys that I could find, then eventually they would all make up one big tree and I would know where I sat in it. And that was when my dad really wanted to know when he was still alive where we where we came from. The idea was that we came somewhere from uh, County Wexford, but it was lost in the midst of time. My dad thought that we were um, only fifth generation Anglo-Irish, uh, sort of, and we'd come over um, with the famine. And it turned out that that was rubbish. Um, there was a quite a lot of other rubbish that I had to deal with as well. Um, but uh, we, uh, the Fitz, our Fitzhenry branch had come 
come over at least uh, before 1810. And before that, we were poor Irish Catholics and there is no records. So um, I started to do uh, the DNA when it first came out. I was very pleased that I did because uh, since then, some of our original um, men that I've tested have since uh, died. So that we've, but we've still got their records. And uh, first of all, it showed that we weren't related to any of us. Our, our little Fitzhenry family stuck in East London. Um, and, and then it got to be a bit of an obsession. So I started putting together all of these trees in a big database. William, uh, William Fitzhenry's tree was actually one of the first ones I did. I thought because I found him originally in Surrey with his second family, they must be related to us in Essex. So um, they're, they're actually tree number three. And I've been up to 119 trees at any one time. And uh, each time I find a link, I merge them in. But the, uh, the ones, they still keep their numbers and they merge into a lower number. So um, I did a quick look at what I've actually got in the, the DNA database. And so far I've uh, DNA tested 24 Fitzhenry uh, and Fitzharris men. And they are, that, that name is interchangeable in Wexford. And so, especially amongst the Catholics, which I'm one, uh, well, uh, tribally, I'm uh, from an Irish Catholic family. Um, but there were a lot of, um, uh, Protestant Fitzhenry's as well and virtually all of them uh, have one Pacific DNA type except for the family of William Fitzhenry. He, you know, he looks like everything he does is uh, a what I would think of as from the Protestant lines but he doesn't match in with the rest of the Protestant lines. Um, and I know that because I have tested uh, one of his great, great grandsons through his second marriage with Martha Eagles. Unfortunately, there are no surviving um, male descendants for William through his line with um, uh, Barbara Morris. So that's what's called daughtering out. You lose that ability to test the male X cro uh, Y chromosome line. So I've got this one um, uh, person that I've tested through um, William's line. I'm hoping that at some point by testing other random Fitzhenry's that I'm going to get a match and then we can go, you know, latch on to see where he fits in because he's a mystery man to me. He lies a lot, <laughs> almost as much as Barbara lies. Um, and he's obviously very much a social climber. All the, the things that we've got about him are self-reported. He says that he is born in Dublin and on the 1st of March 1830 in a specific uh, parish of St Mary's. The parish of St Mary's, the records still exist, unlike a lot of um, uh, parish records from that time, and there is nothing for him there. Um, he, um, he gives uh, two different father's names and two different father's occupations for each of his marriage. For the first one, he says his father is a, a linen draper called Robert. He doesn't have anybody to impress for this first marriage. He's marrying a young widow who is desperate to get remarried and have someone look, look after her and her young child. On his second marriage, he says that his father is called Hester and he's a lawyer. Um, I have no other record of a Hester or any other Fitzhenry lawyers uh, that anywhere near that um, in, in Ireland at the time. Um, so I think that's just one big fib there. He also um, does things, he spends money way beyond his means. He hires the Queen's own uh, physician when he gets heart failure and in the end he leaves this in, immense will where he's doling out money left right and centre but in fact his estate is only worth £300 when he dies and his youngest children end up in an orphanage. So he's a man of mystery 
And I'm so pleased that uh, Kath has agreed to do a, uh, a DNA test for the Fitzhenry study, because we've also got one of um, uh, William's great, great granddaughters from the Martha Eagle side. So wherever they match up, it's on William's DNA because it isn't contaminated by mother's DNA. So um, we're just, uh, yeah, just really happy. And if we can find then a third person who matches up with any it, with um, this this particular DNA pattern um, in any other Fitzhenry line, we know that we've got a lock and load on him. <laughs> so um, that's where I am with um, with William. Um, he say he's a mystery. He doesn't seem to fit into any of the other families. I was hoping that I could slot him neatly into the Protestants of Wicklow. It's one of the few Protestant families I haven't tested. Um, they're a family that just sort of like, just really just died out. But I think there are one or two of them that have uh, still got descendants. And I'm, it, it's really difficult to approach people and say, can I do your DNA? Because they just get the wrong idea. So um, I have virtually have to wait for people to approach me. So the, uh, the DNA study runs in, in concert with my blog. And I'm hoping that once I get the blog re going again, it gets some attention and people will come and volunteer their DNA and their spit for me again. Mm -hmm. As you were saying, you know, William told lots of lies. He, yeah. um, we think he joined the army, um, Blair knows more about this, but we think he joined the army at the end of 1847, which is mm. a pretty important year in the history of Ireland, as well as in the history of uh, the Highlands, um, because of the potato famine. So he joined up as a private with the second battalion of the 60th Rifles, and very much you can see this pattern of social climbing um, through the army. He started off as a private, um, did quite well, killed quite a few people probably uh, in South Africa <laughs> in the 1850s and ends up leaving as a captain. Um, you know, so he definitely did, you know, the British army in the 19th century for him definitely was about social mobilization. Um, and if we look at Barbara as well, her story is very much about social climbing as well. She has this amazing story that, you know, it took me ages to find her birth record. Um, and it's only because of somebody on Ancestry, actually, that we found her birth record. Um, and I went there this weekend, actually, to, to the house in Edmonton. Um, that her father was indeed a gardener for Alexander Fraser. He wasn't a laird. Um, he actually was a slave owner who had bought an estate um, and made lots of money off the slave trade, uh, lived in this absolutely glorious, huge, big house, uh, Barconi Castle, um, and the gardener's cottage is still there. The castle isn't there, but the gardener's cottage is still there. The garden, the walled garden is still there. Um, she had seen this, you know, as a child, she'd seen this wonderful grand existence and she wanted it for herself. Um, she ends up, when she's 15 years old, she's working as a farm servant on the Isle of Skye, so not quite sure yet how she went from Edmonton back to Skye. And then she becomes a dressmaker in the Gorbals. Um, we don't know how she gets to Jersey, um, but she marries uh, Charles de Sauteur from Jersey. She has two children with him. One of them dies in infancy, and then he dies of pneumonia. Two months later, she's marrying William Fitzhenry um, by special license. And... Um. They clearly have a very good relationship because they have five children in six years. And then she goes off to India with him and she goes from being this farm servant um, to actually being described as a lady in a newspaper. Um, and if you look at the, the uh, officer's accommodation um, at the Winchester barracks, as it was Back then, it's been knocked, the officer's block has been knocked down now. But it was absolutely stunning, um, absolutely glorious. Um, I think it's on the 1861 census that she's listed living there with William and their children, um, along with the captain and um, the commander and, you know, all these grand people. Um, and this is a girl that was a farm servant um, that left the Highlands, presumably, because of famine um, and looking for a better life in Glasgow. 
Um, so it's, it's got an amazing story, absolutely amazing story. If there's a photograph of that, that was originally the quartermaster's house for the unit that was based in Winchester. Wow. Now, I'm not saying that William lived in that house because he may not have been the quartermaster for the depot or for the battalion that was stationed there, but certainly um, it's a very nice hotel to stay in and you only get one room. He had the whole lot, <laughs> potentially. <laughs> I'm going to pass over to Dr Jim McPherson, who's very kindly agreed to come along and talk to us a little bit about the history uh, kind of aspects to do with Empire and uh, the Highlands. Good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here. Um, I'd just like to pick up on uh, one thing that Joe was saying uh, just a few moments ago about the, the, the circumstances in which um, Barbara Morrison grows up and you know, hypothesizing about why she she moves away from the region, goes elsewhere and, and, and embarks on this amazing global adventure. And just earlier today, I was um, looking up um, Evanston, where she grows up, and um, that part of the Highlands experience of the famine during the late 1840s. And how do we look at this wonderful book? Um, it's by uh, Jim Hunter, Insurrection about um, the, the height of uh, the famine in the Highlands during 1847. And there are some really interesting passages on Evanston, um, which I think just give a flavor of the kinds of uh, circumstance and environments uh, from which Barbara comes and which um, prompt her to think, well, hang on, uh, I can find a better life for myself. So I'm just gonna read a couple of extracts for you. Um, so this is in 1840, late 1846, um, in Everton uh, as early as November, millers and meal dealers ceased trading in small amounts of meal. So this is a uh, grain crop uh, to quote many needy persons, even when with money in their hands, being obliged to return home without a supply. There as elsewhere, difficulties were aggravated by the frost and snow brought by one of the hardest seasons seen for many years. The bitter weather leading to layoffs among even the minority of men who had managed to find work. The outcome was summarised in a petition sent to Russia's commissioners of supply by the labouring class in the village of Evanton. Uh, and to quote, owing to the total failure of the potato crop, the severity of the winter and the entire want of demand for labour, these commissioners were informed, your petitioners, the poor of Evanton, are reduced to the lowest degree of poverty and distress. Many having had no meal in their households for weeks, have subsisted entirely on boiled turnips and such other vegetables as they could with difficulty from time to time procure. It's a really tough situation. Um, and then, you know, the, 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 the labouring poor of Evanston and other villages and settlements in this part of the world, that, that, that they start to think, well, hang on, let, let's do something about this. And there are all kinds of, of mini rebellions, mini riots going on at this time in 1847. And here we have in Evanston, where they're um, protesting against the, the hoarding of, of, of food in um, one of the storehouses um, on the shores of the Cromarty Firth, which in fact is now called the storehouse. It's a very fancy uh, eatery, deli kind of place, but in the 1840s it was used to uh, secure food and keep it from those who actually needed the poor of, of Evanston. So here we have the description again in, in Jim Hunter's books. From Evanston, meanwhile, came reports of a party of ill-disposed persons parading through the village with a view to inciting the inhabitants to outrage. This was in response to several cargoes of barley having been shipped for the south from ne nearby Fowles Point. Shipments, it was resolved in Evanston, should be permitted, and with a view to enforcing this resolution, several hundred people promptly gathered in the vicinity of the Point Storehouse Complex, a complex capable of housing a great deal of grain. And then there's a great story about them, you know, camping out on the beach and a piper playing and, and all the rest, and, and eventually the, uh, the militia turn up to, to, to scare them off. But it gives you a nice indication of the kind of context from which Barbara's coming. It's, it's a hard life in the Highlands in the 1840s, so it's no wonder that she goes out into the world to, to seek a better life. Um, but for me, the, the dress, the, 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 the fascinating thing about this is that it's a story of migration and empire and how the movement of Scots around the globe was facilitated by military service. 
Um, but I think the dress tells a slightly different story uh, to what you see in a lot of the, uh, the published work on this um, and its focus on, on certain elements of, of gender and class. Because I think Barbara's dress situates empire at the heart of the experience of a woman from quite an ordinary background. And, and this is what I think makes it really interesting and special. So a lot of the, the scholarship on um, the Highlands and empire that focuses on military service looks at a much earlier period. So the, the 18th and early 19th century, such as in this splendid book, uh, Andrew McKillop's More Fruitful Than the Soil, uh, which is a, is a wonderful book about how military recruitment becomes one of the main commercial concerns in, in the Highlands. It's a way of, of uh, landlords uh, making money from recruitment, and it's a way for, for tenants to, to make money by military service. And as uh, McKillop says in the title of his book, military service becomes more fruitful than being uh, a labourer on the land, uh, working it and growing crops and all, all the rest. Um, but the dress, Barbara Morrison's dress, demonstrates that um, emigration's connection with this imperial military service, it continues way into the 19th century and beyond, way into the 20th century as well. And it's a mechanism through which people from the Highlands it's a way in which they see the world, and that is quite extraordinary. Um, but again, here I think the dress is telling us a slightly different story to one which we might expect. Um, and it's one in which military service is facilitating um, the emigration of women and families um, across empire. And again, that, that, that touches on a lot of the recent scholarship in the past few years, which establishes the importance of marriage and families in the development of empire networks. So there's been great work done by the Legacies of British Slave Ownership database team uh, down at uh, University College London. Uh, Katie Donington has done great work on, on the Hibbert family and, and their multi-generational experience of, of being slave owners and all the rest. Uh, Margot Finn has done amazing work on, on families and the East India Company. Uh, in my own research on the Clan Macpherson Museum, uh, we've come across some really fascinating marriage connections that are facilitated by empire. So for example, our, our 20th chief, um, Ewan Macpherson, in 1832, he marries uh, Sarah Justina Davidson of the Davidsons of Tullock. Uh, Tullock is just outside Dingwall, uh, near to where Barbara grows up in Edmonton. And the Davidsons of Tullock are serious slave owners uh, in Grenada and the Beast and Jamaica and all over the place. And she brings significant money into the marriage with uh, Ewan Macpherson, uh, which then sustains um, the, uh, the prosperity of, of Clan Macpherson through the 19th century. But here we have in the evidence of, of, of the, the, the dress, it's, it's a story about a significantly less socially elite person with these kinds of empire connections. Uh, this is someone who was a crofter's daughter and who marries a fairly, you know, mid-ranking soldier. Of course, we, 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 have, we do have a, a story of social mobility in um, William uh, Fitzhenry's rise from being a private to a captain, but still he's not, you know, at the very top of the tree running the show. He's still a, a fairly middle-ranking kind of, of officer. Um, and it demonstrates that these kinds of connection to empire were everywhere. Um, the, you know, the, the dress in many ways, it's, it's remarkable. It's an incredible object to have in a Highland Museum. That is absolutely amazing. But the story that it tells reflects a, a common experience of empire uh, and emphasizes that sort of everydayness of empire. So yes, the, the, the dress itself, absolutely not everyday, but the story it tells us, it's about how empire was a common experience across social classes, across genders, in the 19th century and across the British Isles. It is quite remarkable. Um, also, I think the dress raises some really important questions about why military service continues to be a key driver of emigration for people from places like the Highlands, like Ireland in the case of, of William Fitzhenry. So um, as we've already heard, uh, Barbara's husband, uh, William, he begins military service in the 1850s. He has postings in India during the 1860s and 1870s. And this is a period of, of, of significant 
British colonial expansion. It's often termed that this era of, of new imperialism, where Britain is seeking to expand its colonial possessions. In a, a recent book um, by Dan Hicks, uh, the British Museum, museums even, British Museums, a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, he calls this period World War Zero. Um, and he uses this term to capture the global extent of these so-called small wars that Britain engaged in in Britain and across much of Asia, um, extending British colonial domination through military force. So that's the other story here for me, that yes, this is an incredible, beautiful object, but the reason it's here in the Highlands is because it tells a story of the region's involvement in this process of violent colonial domination and it's important to acknowledge that as well. And um, finally, um, I think the, the everydayness of um, Highlands empire connections can be seen not just through Barbara's process of, of emigration following her husband's military service and all the rest, um, but also through Barbara's experience of in early life, as, as Joe has already alluded to. I'd just like to say a, a couple more things about that. Um, as Joe told us, um, Barbara's born on the Balcony Estates in Evanston, and this is a village that's built by Alexander Fraser in 1806. Now, Fraser is a very uh, dubious character, to say the least. He is uh, the business partner of the Baileys of Dochfur, and these are one of the biggest enslaving families around. They are big, big business, making a huge amount of money from this. And um, as Alexander Fraser profits from this considerably. So Barbara grows up on lands and in a village that's built on the profits of slavery. Um, indeed, the streets of Edmonton to this day are named after Alexander Fraser's plantations in Grenada and other places. So she, she grows up, Barbara grows up in a place that is, is shaped by empire, shaped by, by slavery. And then the life that she goes on to live is then shaped by this experience of empire through her husband's military service. And that for me is absolutely fascinating that it runs through her entire life. And this experience is not <clears throat> unusual. I think that's something that, that we need to, to, to recognize that, that there are other Barbaras out there, other stories, but I don't think any of them have quite as magnificent a dress that has been left to us uh, in the West Highland Museum. And I'll, I'll leave it there, thanks. Oh, thank you, Jim. That was amazing. Thank you. Um, we're going to hand over to Blair now um, to tell us a little bit about his museum, the regiment. Yes, good evening. Thank you, Joe. Um, you contacted the museum, first of all, I think last summer, um, asking if we had any information about William Fitzhenry, and we managed to turn up a photograph that showed him as a, as a quartermaster. I think it's actually worth, let, let me set the scene. I'm, I'm really excited to be involved with this project for two or three reasons. Based around genealogy, I've been doing genealogy as an amateur for over 20 years. I've, I've researched my four grandparents' lines and on one line I've got back to 1180. Um, on another line, I discovered that my great-great-grandfather on my mother's side was a Parsi from India. And he came to this country in 1840 for a year to study steam machinery. And he went back to work in the family business. And the family business was building ships for the East India Company. The family were the Wadiyas, um, and at Hartlepool, they've got one of the ships, HMS Trincomalee, which they built in Bombay. So the combination of India and things military and genealogy, um, this excites me. The 60th having been renamed the King's Royal Rifle Corps, and the second battalion was stationed in Dublin, essentially doing the job of a militia unit, so there to police the country and the countryside. And he was in that battalion, I think, from 1847, from memory, until 1855, authority was given to raise a third battalion 
of the King's Royal Rifle Corps. The 3rd Battalion was created and eight sergeants and 530 riflemen were transferred from the 2nd Battalion to help form uh, this new unit. At that point, from his service record, it shows he transferred as a rifleman, but on the first day of the new battalion's existence, he was promoted to corporal and then to sergeant. Now, that's not social mobility. That's like getting on Tesla's rocket in, in going up because the sergeants would have lived differently within the regiment. Um, they, would, they would have their own mess. Uh, it, it was certainly a big step up. It, it was a, a career enhancement for him. He probably had no expectations that that was going to happen. Um, and whether he would have been promoted even to corporal had he remained in his other unit, um, we don't know. The other thing that it would have given him would it, is it would have given him um, almost the authority to marry. Marriage was um, not popular for the rank and file. And if a battalion was posted overseas, the number of accompanying wives and children was restricted to one in 10 of the battalion. And the way they were picked was very much by seniority. Now, interestingly, um, Barbara Morrison's very quick marriage or remarriage um, in Jersey perhaps was to um, provide a husband who was going to look after herself and her child. And this is something that we would see happening within the British Army, particularly when they were in India. If a soldier who was accompanied by his wife um, was killed or died of illness, it was quite common for the wife to remarry one of his colleagues very, very quickly because she was on her own. She wouldn't necessarily get a pension um, and she certainly wouldn't have the money that she would need to get herself back to England. So from an economic point of view, it was almost an imperative. And I wonder if that was the situation um, when he was part of the depot company of the battalion when it went to Jersey. He then progressed through the ranks. He became a regimental sergeant major of, um, I think, a volunteer unit. I haven't been able to identify from the abbreviation that appeared in his service record quite where he went. There's a, a little bit more work to be done to try and see if I can find that out. But as part of that progression, he would probably have become a colour sergeant. And one of the roles of a colour sergeant also carries the title the company quartermaster sergeant. Company quartermaster sergeant is responsible for the stores of his company. There was a regimental quartermaster sergeant who was a warrant officer. And the RQMS was the right-hand man of the quartermaster, which is what he ultimately became. So once he got above the rank of sergeant, he would have been going through um, some training and experience of looking after stores and equipment and of course, having to keep his nose clean, because when annual inspections came around, one of the things that the general officer would have been looking at is do the records tie up with the stocks that are actually being held? And you, you needed to be on top of the game in order to ensure that your, your records were right and that the, you, you were not letting the regiment down. When he was appointed as a quartermaster for the 3rd Battalion and then went out to India, it's interesting, I've heard comments tonight about him being a, a middle-ranking kind of officer. Yes, a captain, which was probably an honorary rank for him, 
it was fair to say he would have been a middle ranking officer in that battalion. Unfortunately, the quartermasters were seen as being rather the lowest of the pecking order of officers. I've always been aware that the, there are stories documented <clears throat> in guards regiments, for example, that when they list the officers in order of seniority, they get to the, the second lieutenants and then come the quartermaster. Now, there were four positions in the officer's uh, hierarchy. There was the adjutant of the regiment, there was the quartermaster, there was the paymaster, and there was the surgeon. The adjutant was generally a regular officer with the rank then of lieutenant. The quartermaster was called the quartermaster, and he usually held um, an honorary rank. He might have started out as an honorary lieutenant and subsequently became an honorary captain. Surgeons may or may not have had a rank. Certainly in the 1860s, the records that I've been looking at today, the surgeons are, or the doctors, are just referred to as surgeon and assistant surgeons with no rank associated with it. The paymaster was often either a major or a captain, but they were generally not fighting soldiers, um, or not seen as being fighting soldiers. Um, and, and so I'm, I'm not sure how um, strong the evidence of social mobility in a regiment which was... Uh, quite a social body, um, that the 60th were a, a classy regiment, as it were. Um, I'm, I'm not sure to what extent the evidence actually stands up in, in the military context. When they were out in India, um, there's not very much in the regimental history at all about what they got up to. They were posted initially to, to Madras, and my belief is that they were basically carrying out garrison duties there. Um, they went out in 1867, so 10 years after the Indian mutiny. And typically in those days, a British battalion was brigaded with three battalions of the Indian army. Um, and they were there very much for security to make sure that the Indians didn't mutiny again. If they were up in the northwest frontier, then there was much more active service that was going on there. But the 3rd Battalion weren't involved at that stage. But he would have been responsible for all of the battalion's equipment and stores. He would have been responsible for feeding the battalion, getting food in. If they went out on exercise, um, it would be the quartermaster's responsibility to make sure that all of the stores and equipment were carried properly. And we, we've seen some photographs of the methods that were used with photographs of elephants now, whether elephants were used for um, carrying this stuff by our regiment is not clear to me. But um, I think he had a huge amount of responsibility. And had they actually been on campaign, he would have had to have moved food and ammunition up to the front line to keep the fighting soldiers um, fed, watered and with bullets available to them. So he was, he was a very key man within the battalion. And certainly he did very well. It was not, I, I don't think it was the kind of thing that a, a soldier when he enlisted ever thought, I hope to become the quartermaster. Um, he would probably have hoped just to survive to get a pension. <clears throat> but, um, I, I read today in the history is that I think in 1840, when mess dress was introduced, the mm. regiment took it upon themselves not to wear it with the jacket buttoned up. So they left it unbuttoned and wore a waistcoat yeah. underneath. And that mm -hmm. was really frowned upon by the hierarchy in the war office. But over a period of time, um, it was adopted by the rest of the British Army as the way to do it.
<laughs> so they're obviously the trendsetters of the of the British Army in the 1860s. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Blair. Um, we're now going to pass over to Kenna in New York. Um, Kenna's going to talk to us about her research into beetle wing dresses. And um, I'll hand over to you, Kenna. Thank you. Thank you. As Vanessa said, I'm Kenna Levis. I did a great deal of research in 2019-2020 on the history of Victorian beetle wing dresses. And Barbara Morrison's dress fits quite neatly, actually, in this timeline of beetle wing dresses spanning from about 1820 to the late 1890s is where I, I ended up leaving it off. And just to clarify, when I say beetle wing, I'm referring actually to Elytra, the hard wing casings that cover the actual wings of the jewel beetle. So I have one here. This is a modern one. Um, not an antique, but they look exactly the same. They're quite hard. I don't know if you can hear that. Um, and very pointy. <laughs> so, and this is pretty standard. It's a little more than two centimeters long. So um, they're sewn on by boring holes around the edges, and then you can pass a needle and your thread through. So uh, out of about two dozen extant beetle wing gowns that I was able to find, more than half of them have a Buddha design, which is a sort or a sort of uh, evolved neo Buddha, like the kind that we see on Barbara Morrison's skirt. Um, most of you probably know the Buddha as a paisley. Of course, it has such a large connection to Scotland through the manufacture of cashmere shawls. Um, and because I think partially of that association with them, they seem to become an enduring symbol of India in the Victorian period, much like muslin, gold work, and beetle wings. <laughs> um, and of course, this dress has all of those things in spades. So as with Morrison's dress, all of the extant gowns from before about 1890 are white, um, though there is evidence of black gowns in remaining textile fragments in museums. Um, and all of them before the late 1880s are cotton, actually, which is quite fun, save for one, I believe, in the National Museum of Scotland. So um, I know most people wouldn't think about that if they're asked to imagine a Victorian evening gown, but um, muslin, very, very thin cotton was very expensive. And uh, I think it's heyday was really more 1810s to 1830s, but it did last. So this dress is from about the same time as another from the Victorian Albert Museum, late 1860s, um, though it is less fashion forward. And it looks more like an earlier 1860s gown actually in the collection of the Kent State University Museum in the US, also a beetle wing gown. Um, and that gown was made in India for export. We have the provenance. So it's no wonder that the quality and style of work is similar. I was happy to, happy to learn about that. The style of decoration on these dresses is entirely different from anything used in India before or during this time, which is actually what interested me initially for my own research. Where did this style come from? You just see it pop up in the 1820s and that's it. Um, so beetle wings were used in Mughal textile decoration across India, but this seems to be a uniquely English design scheme, though obviously it proliferated to Scotland, America, and eventually Australia. Um, there aren't very many extant dresses. It seems that they were primarily worn by women who had been to India, as we've noted, or who had family connections. Um, and earlier in the century, they are cited more commonly on women attending the Queen's drawing room in English newspapers, but they kind of fade out after that. Um, so it is, as best we can tell, you just track it through newspaper mentions of women attending fancy soirees and through these extant garments that we found. So by the end of the century, they were very much only curiosities, um, you know, of the natural world of entomology, um, prized for their beautiful color shifting properties. And I, that was one of the reasons that museums actually have so many small textile pieces still um, in their collections, mostly from the 1880s, 1890s, really early 1900s, instead of these enormous hard to deal with gowns. Um, and think of the Macbeth dress, uh, of course, painted by John Singer Sargent. That's late 1880s. Um, I think that actually might be the most enduring beetle wing item in popular memory. I hear people talk about that all the time still. Um, and I, I don't count it in my research because it is a theater costume. It is not something meant for a, a ball or, um, or a dinner, anything like that. It's really, it's about the curiosity. It's about the difference and the exoticism in that. Um, so really good example there though. And I, uh, Back to Barbara, really the Morrison dress is unique in Scotland as far as I could tell because um, the Denali Preservation Trust and the National Museums both own dresses, but they're quite a different style and the Elytra work is much earlier. They're from the 1820s, um, 1830s. They might even, the, um, the pieces that the National Museum Scotland owns are actually, it looks like they have trim that was from much earlier. Um, Lady Strange brought that from India. She lived in India in the very early 1800s, I think 1807 
around then. So um, the style of work is actually a lot more Indian. It's it's not something that you see in these later dresses. So um, Barbara's dress really is is unique in Scotland and, and really wonderful, but she would probably have been following in the steps of at least a few other Scottish women in wearing this dress back home. So um, as, as Jim so kindly noted, these dresses were very much a way to announce one's worldliness, um, your place in the colonial scheme. Uh, they were very expensive formal gowns. Uh, they wouldn't have been used casually in a way that you would try to use another, you know, silk expensive dress. You'd refashion it over the years, try to get your money's worth out of that textile because it's so expensive. But when you've put these all over your dress, <laughs> um, this is actually something I really like about the Indian style of use is that they tended to be cut up into little sequins and it's much harder to break them then. It is, these are hard but it is easier to break them when they're still in this large form. So they really wouldn't have been used casually like that, um, but they would have been symbols of India and the colonial regime. So I, this is really quite a unique object and I was so happy to find it when I did. Mum obviously spent a lot of time with her family. Her mum and dad were from London. And I can remember my mum saying about her going to stay with her gran and her granddad. So mum probably, I, I'm, I'm trying to work out how mum's got her information with no internet because it just didn't exist. And it must have been word of mouth. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there, 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 there's, it's, it's hard to imagine, isn't it? A time before the internet, but it did exist. And it wasn't that long ago. Um, and I, I'm, you know, I, I, I am old enough to, to remember do, doing historical <laughs> research, but before those days. And and yeah, um, you, you are reliant on, on, on going, visiting physical buildings full of physical documents, um, which, you know, it, it's not quite as straightforward as, as what we have today, at the, the, the click of a mouse and all the rest. Um, but still, you know, this was a, a fairly common way of, of, of doing research and, and doing family research and you would do... No, I, th I think you're probably right. She lived in London mm. before she joined the army. She did live in London. But my point being, for her to be able to come up with all of these names, yes, there were in the Bible, in the family Bible, the names and dates, but it's just that my mum spent a lot of time with her gran. And when you think about it, it's only one generation back. Mm. Yeah, and that's my point I think that's yeah. I've no doubt she will have spent a lot of time museums records she loved anything like that but it just made me stop and think you know it's not actually that long ago we're only talking a couple of jumps really when you think family wise and so, I think a lot of it will have been word of mouth that's yeah. yeah I was thinking about that I've been thinking about that a lot really she'd have just absolutely loved all of this yeah, you're absolutely right. Word of mouth. The, the, the stories we tell each other as families are, are really important, aren't they? And of course, you know, we, we know that there are some red herrings along the way, as, as, as Joe was explaining yeah. earlier with, yeah. with William Fitzhenry. Uh, people are liable to tell porkies quite a lot about, about mm -hmm. the lies. But equally, that the, there are really interesting stories that, that tell us an awful lot. Even the lies are interesting, aren't they? They, they, they yeah. have insight into the character of people. Um, yeah. I think my, my own family experience, um, I, I have, I think I, I brought this along to class once when, when Joe, Joe was there. Um, we, we, we little um, uh, 19th century Indian silverware yeah. that, that I had inherited from my mum, who got it from her mom, who was given it by um, a great aunt or someone who knew this, this Lady Sinclair and it's all very bizarre and the story doesn't quite match up with, with real people and it's, it's hard to pull apart exactly what's going on. But yeah, it, it, it's really important that, that those stories that families tell and, and that's how you know, we, we, we get this knowledge of, of, of who, who we are, who our families were. Um, I think that that's, oh goodness, um, it's one of my great regrets that I didn't I didn't sit down more with my my gran and get those stories yeah. and record them <laughs> I know well I feel really bad now because my mum was was extremely eccentric <laughs> is a better way of putting it so it was just a family joke we'd switch off I really wish I hadn't <laughs> I know, I know. Well, we, we, th 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 this kind of knowledge is wasted on the young, isn't it? You know, we're, uh, well, it must have been. I just, <laughs> I really do sure feel bad. All about, yeah. <laughs> so, just thinking about um, people coming to the museum and things, and the dress. Has it ever been commented on 
how the dress kind of stands out from other items in the museum at all? People have commented um, because it is so different. I mean, it's it's in a room where everything else is tartan, basically, um, from sort of the 18th century through to the late 19th century. So it is pretty unique. Um, we did have a, a limited interpretation next to it, um, explaining about Barbara um, and the fact that it had come from India, but that was as far as it went. And I mean, um, you're busy at the moment working away on some fantastic new interpretation boards for the temporary exhibition. And one of those will, will go back into the, the main exhibition once um, Barbara's dress goes back into the Victorian collection again. So it'll, it'll be wonderful just to, to have all, all, all that backstory explaining about her. Uh, you've even managed to track down Barbara's signature, which I think is pretty yeah. amazing as well. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't got a photo of her. We've got a photo, in fact, we've got two photos of William, mm -hmm. um, but we haven't got a photo of Barbara. So I kind of really wanted something of her to be in the exhibition. So the next best thing is her signature. So um, that's, that's why I've included it on the interpretation panel. Um, is the shawl the same date? Roughly, yes. Um, it's, yeah. I think it was produced in a different part of India. Um, I'm gonna, All right. I'm going to have to get, the photo, get a photo of it and send it to Kenna. It's absolutely ginormous. Um, it, is it heavy? No, it's very, very light. Right, it isn't the one I'm thinking of then. Um, it's basically it's a huge big piece of net mm -hmm. that's been embroidered on around the edge um, it's a particular style from a particular I've, I've got a feeling it's the north of India that the style is from I can't remember exactly in uh, my head it was white and the one I remember mm -hmm. I don't know why I do it was metal work on it it, it is a beautiful shawl. I mean, they had been displayed together from 1996 until um, last year when Joe initially came up to assess the dress. Um, at that point, um, we, we both decided to remove the dress because it, it, it was just hiding the beautiful yes. beetle wing um, decoration on the bodice. So it's actually in store at the moment, but um, we, we do have plans to bring it out for the temporary exhibition. So it will be on display um, from June through to November. Looking uh, at the original photograph that I was sent when I first inquired about this to you <laughs> in, in what, 2019? Um, and it's just, it's this lovely dress um, with no skirt support and the shawl is just yeah. almost entirely covering it. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm, I'm very glad it's been mounted again and given a new life. Um, unfortunately, yeah. I don't know what the, the style of work is there, but yeah, it's silk white embroidery, beautiful. Well, Joe had made um, a new crinoline for it last year. So, mm. so it's looking amazing compared to those original photos you had in 2019. Um, but sadly, the full size crinoline is too big for the exhibition space. So Joe's going to be making um, a new the correct site. Yes, a bit <laughs> new correct size crinoline for the temporary exhibition. So the dress will be on display in all its glory um, for the six months. But then sadly, it's going to have to go into the smaller crinoline to fit back in in the permanent space. <laughs> saying, um, it's interesting to think how the dress would have been passed down because um, Barbara would have bought this back with her uh, from India and it would uh, whether she got the chance to sort of use it much when she was back in Winchester. She died in Winchester in 1877. Um, and at the time, the only one of her daughters who would have uh, you know, been of an age to appreciate it was Henrietta, her, her daughter with Charles Le Sauter. And um, so, because Annie, her daughter with um, William was, was only nine at the time. So it probably went to Henrietta, first of all. And in Henrietta's will, um, she uh, it's very much the will of a well-off spinster lady, leaving virtually everything to be sorted out by her, her younger brother, um, George. Um, and it says who the, the things are going to go to and all her sort of like little knickknacks and her, 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 her dresses um, are to be split very much between her younger sister Annie um, and the, the nieces, the, the daughters of um, uh, Isabel Cooper. And then, so that, that takes into account uh, Kath's um, grandmother and uh, Annie Bell's net, Kath. 
sorry. I'm just, yeah. I was, I was sorry. I was trying to work it out in my head as you were saying it. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, that, but, and, that's, yeah. and that's how it, we think it, it probably came down sort of like to, to Henrietta first of all, and then like a cross and yeah. then down. Yeah. 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 So lovely finding out about the family associated with the dress as well um and you know we're so grateful for to Tanya to Kath's mum um for providing yeah. that information to the museum when she donated it to the museum oh she'd have loved you all you'd never have been able to get off she'd have been living <laughs> up there <laughs> oh. <laughs> she'd have been telling you all where you're going wrong and how she could have done it better and which bits were right and wrong <laughs> She would have really enjoyed it. Yeah. But you can enjoy it for her now. I just wish I'd listened more. <laughs> yeah, my question is for Dr. Joe. Um, do you think that William Fitzhenry is actually a Fitzhenry? Or might his name also be a fib? I've never thought of that. Well, I no. had, <laughs> yeah. yeah, and um, I wonder, because of this, um, so m most of us who have been in the email trail know about um, sort of like the search for his baptism record and mm. searching in the parish of St Mary's uh, baptism register. And it's not quite the 1st of March, um, 1830. It's a few months before in November, 1829. It, there is the baptism of a William, the son of Robert and Hester Henry. Now, this seems to be too much of a coincidence. It's the name he gives us his father for his first marriage and the name he gives us his father in the second marriage. And Hester, even in Ireland, isn't of a, a, a male name no. um and when he you know, he just said why is he lying to the the eagles family they wouldn't have the first clue about what his provenance was you know he could have he could have made up anything it just it just feels weird that he's 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 put what's potentially his mother's name uh into uh, and made it his father's name and called him hester a lawyer um, it's it just really right. the Eagles family that he married into were moneyed. They were old money from Buckinghamshire and Oxford, um, and um, they sort of seemed to pick up the pieces when William died of what was left of his family. Um, so uh, he did have an older oldest daughter by um, uh, Martha Eagles, who was also called Hester, Hester Cordelia, and um, I actually have a whole load of letters between her and her husband during the First World War when he oh. was enlisted. <laughs> it was going to be it was going to be a project at some point to transcribe all these letters and get them out there. Um, but Hester went to live with um, Woodfield Eagles, who is um, who, who was Martha's, uh, Martha Eagles' brother, um, who was a doctor and probably got um, George, the son from the first marriage, and uh, Rowley, the, son, the oldest son from the second marriage, into medical school and looked after their medical careers. Um, and then there was also the wonderfully named Woodfield Duncombe Eagles Fitzhenry. So all, all of these wonderful old names. And it's the um, granddaughter of that Woodfield who has also done the um, DNA test that we're going to be sort of like matching her and Kath up with. That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Coming back to the um, baptism records from yes. St Mary's. Yes. I, I know very little, call it nothing, about Irish genealogy because I have no Irish connections right. in my family at all. I noticed that looking, I've been going through today the service records of mm -hmm. the officers in the 60th at the time that William was serving. And there are a number of Fitzpatrick's, Fitzgerald's, um, and the one Fitzhenry. If he, did, did he kind of um, improve the name of his family by putting Fitz in front of Henry? Because I, I, I think you said um, you found a, a Robert Henry yeah. 
and fits as I understand it means son of. Yes. So it's not actually a lie to call yourself William, son of Henry, because he was. Well, he well he he would have been son if we if we this is the right family it would have been um, his father would have been Robert right so okay so but, it's been yeah, yeah. The, the problem with Irish records is that there's there was an incremental um, destruction of the records yeah. sort of like during the nineteenth century um, a lot were just very badly looked after um, there were. It, the census records were deliberately pulped for uh, reusing the paper, so we haven't got Irish census records. And then there was the tragedy in the Civil War in 1922 of the Four Courts Fire, when to protect all of the records that still survived, they put them into this fabulous new building, um, which was supposed to be bomb fireproof from the outside, except that one of the factions got inside, used it as a munitions dump, and the whole lot went up from the inside. Um, and you see the pictures of the Four Courts fire. And as an Irish genealogist, my heart weeps when you see that. Um, some bits survive. The parish records, uh, both Catholic and Protestant for Dublin, weren't uh, kept in the Four Courts um, uh, record office. So they survived. There are bits and pieces around, uh, but if you're trying to um, uh, sort of like research uh, Irish Protestant families, yeah, there's a, there are big holes in 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 the in the records there. Yeah, so you know, he he, I may be doing him a disservice, and he may have yes, he may have been born in St Mary's, but he might have been back there. Uh, baptised at a family church that wasn't in in Dublin and that was where the um, you know and that was one of the records that was lost so I don't know. Quick question um, is there any chance that the male Hester was the equivalent of transgender? Uh, not I wouldn't think in 1830. I'm pretty sure we have evidence of people that far back. Um, okay so when James you Barry in the, at the turn of the century, 1789 to 1865, for example. Okay, so, okay. so are you, this is from a baptism record. So it's uh, Robert and Hester is the, uh, and given as a mother. So um, I kind of think it's more likely to be a fabrication, I'm afraid to say. You yeah. never know. Um, it, yeah. could be, it could be a transgender person, but checking through all the options. Yeah. yeah. And uh, the, the fact that this Hester was called a lawyer, um, you know, male, you know, female lawyers weren't a thing um, in especially, you know, especially not in Ireland. It was a very conservative um, uh, the way, the way it, the society at that point, you know, you were either in there in the very strict Protestants or you were sort of like thrashing around on the outside as a Catholic, um, you know, and it was all very uh, regimented the way the society ran. I've had to look through the post office directories as well for, for Dublin, um, and there are no lawyers with the surname Henry, Fitzhenry. No. There's no Hester, there's no Robert, there's, there's nothing. Yeah. Um, my personal gut feeling, and it, it is just a gut feeling at the moment, is that William Fitzhenry was running away from something. Um, he concealed his true origins um, throughout his life, um, much in the same way that Barbara also um, never told anybody that she was born on the Balcony estate in Edmonton. She always gave her birthplace as Inverness. And on every single official record we've got from her, from marriage certificates to census records, everything has got a very a different age. She's um, always presents herself as younger than she actually is. Um, part of me wonders whether um, William actually knew her true age. Kath and I have spoken about this. Like, why did she um, hide her true age? Why did she? Um, it's just something, uh, just another thing that I find really, really fascinating about this whole story is the fact that we've got these two people um, that kind of made up things a bit um, and it makes you wonder why. I think a lot of that is to do with it must have been absolutely terrifying to have been left with one child. 
Mm. She did have one child when she got married the second time, didn't she? She She did. did. She did, yeah. And I suppose, as awful as this is going to sound, but it is fact, surely you'd have been a better off for being younger and of a childbearing age and desperate to marry somebody rather than being older. Yeah. It's the only thing I can come up with. And the other thing I was going to say is, rightly or wrongly, I get the distinct impression that William was really not liked by the Eagles family. Perhaps mm. Jack can mention that. Um, uh, well, I, yeah, I do get the feeling that... Yeah, uh, I do. That, ...that there was a grudging taking in. Um, yes. Martha had uh, mental health issues and was an alcoholic. Um, and she um, ended her days in a sanatorium for rich women you know, of a nervous disposition. Mm. Um, and, 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 it, and she died... Um, four years after um, William did. So there, there, there was the, the children who... Um, oh, this upsets them, me. Sorry. They, they, the two youngest children did end up in an orphanage. How Hester, can that happen with a family of money like that? Yeah. The, um, Hester, the oldest girl, was taken in by Woodfield Eagles, the doctor. It looked like the um, other two boys um, were... Uh, so, um, Rowley, um, yeah, so, so Rowley was put through school and then went to medical school. Uh-huh. Um, but, um, say, Woodfield and William were in an orphanage. And it didn't seem like an orphanage for sort of like rich ex army officers' children. It, it just seemed, it, it was in Streatham, I think. Uh, just right, I find that just so strange. Yeah. Yeah. I can also, I can sort of go along with that with being brought up on a, an estate myself. I mean, old money is old money, and if you're not old money, you're not accepted. Mm. So I can possibly go along with why you maybe didn't fit because it wasn't old money. But I just find that so sad. Yeah. Mm. Yes. Mm-hmm. Very sad. Yes, especially especially as Woodfield had taken in one child, you know. I know. Surely the others couldn't have, t- t- you know, of, it, you know there, 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 there was a lot of, yeah, there, was, there was a few, few of the Eagles family. They could have, I think, done better. <laughs> yeah, I'd just like to thank everybody for, for joining us um, this afternoon. <laughs> yeah, it's been a really informative discussion. Thank you ever so much, everybody, for joining us, for being part of the project. Um, you know, it's, it's just been a wonderful experience. It has. Um, and... Uh, speak to you all soon and thank you Jim for coming along as well. (laughs) Thanks everybody for joining us this afternoon Um, from University of the Highlands and Islands um, from the DNA database um, Kath Jones and also Kenna as well and particularly Blair also who's the researcher at the Royal Green Jackets Rifles Museum in Winchester. (laughs)